So now, let's get into the fact that matter matters. The body has a language. So I'm going to talk to you about the language of the body. And then there are three main concepts that I'm going to talk about with regard to humans, all humans. Okay? First, I'm going to cover all humans. Then I'm going to get to masculinity and femininity. And then I'm going to get how they're ordered toward each other. Okay? So three main things about all humans. So here they are. And for those of you who teach in public school, those of you who are catechists, these three concepts, I totally suggest that you start from the youngest to the oldest at the age-appropriate level. First one is, the language of the body is to be spoken in truth. The language of the body is to be spoken in truth. What do I mean by that? And what can you say to little kids? Um, here's what I like to talk to about sometimes, is the language of your belly button. The language of the body is the belly button. You ever thought about your belly button and why God left it there? Doesn't matter whether you're NZ or Alsi. Why did God leave the belly button on us? I think it's to speak to us. And what does it say? It says, your mama matters. In sign language, it says, your mama. Your mama matters. And it also reminds you from the very beginning of your existence you were in relationship with another. You were in relationship with your mother in particular. But what should it also teach you? That you're not to be an, an autonomous self. Like me, myself, and I, I decide on everything without taking anyone into account. No, that is mistranslating the language of the body of the belly button. Do you see when I said before, like the point of departure is your body? I started with the belly button and then all the ramifications thereof, and that's kind of a stupid example. What, what's another example about the language of the body? Well, if you think about this, have you ever thought about the smile? What does the smile say? What's the language of the body of the smile? Like, I'm glad to see you. It's good that you're here. It has meaning. The body matters. Matter matters. And therefore, if we do the opposite with the smile, this is a true and factual story. When um, I, I went to Nolan Catholic High School in Fort Worth, and I played volleyball. And I played against this, this team from Bishop Dunn High School. And I was a setter. I was at the net. And I would use the smile and go like this to get the, the other person irritated with me. I was going against the language of the body. I wasn't speaking in truth. I was violating God's gift of a smile. So think about that in many other ways that you and I could learn to live the truth of the language of the body and to also teach that to young people. See, you could live the theology of the body just starting by t teaching a four-year-old, don't smile at a person unless you really mean it. Otherwise, you're telling a lie with the body. Okay, so that's the first principle I wanted to convey to you about um, the language of the body of all humans. And then this idea of having a pure heart and bodily actions corresponding, that's holiness. Let me say that again. If you and your pure heart, your well-formed conscience, you know something is true and with your bodily actions you do it, boom, holiness. Notice the body is important with holiness. A lot of kids, sometimes when I give talks to little kids, I'll say, okay, come up here and show me what holiness is. And they like put a rainbow, rainbow a halo of their head, or they pray or kneel or whatever. That's part of holiness. But then when they hear this, they're like, oh, so I know in my heart I'm supposed to help my mom with the dishes right away. And with my bodily actions, I help her with the dishes. Holiness. And so it's this really wonderful way for them to own Christianity, to start growing in love, and to know that the body matters. And furthermore, what Pope John Paul says in his Theology of the Body is to listen to the inner movements of the heart. The inner movements of the heart. So the more you and I get sensitive to those inner movements, like, Oh, I don't want to call this other person back, but you know what? I think that's what I'm supposed to do. And with your bodily actions, you pick up the phone, call them, text them. That is holiness. The way Pope John Paul calls it in um, the Theology of Bodies, he says, 
the, there is like a marriage between the heart and God's law, the ethos with regard to the, the heart. Ethos is like God's law is married to one's own heart. And then bodily actions follow. If we can get that to kids, think about how they're transformed by just everyday actions. And I would say to you, what about you and me? Whoa, that's it's sort of hard. And, and by the way, um, you know, George, um, George Weigel quoted Angelo Scola, Cardinal Angelo Scola, in uh, Witness to Hope, the biography of Pope John Paul. And Cardinal Scola suggests that every single tenet of the Catholic faith can be taught from a theology of the body perspective. I found that out 12 years ago, and I was a teacher back then before I had to leave to uh, do public speaking. And I tried that. It works. Why do I say that with this slide? Because think about Mother Mary. Her sinlessness. Why is she sinless? Because at every moment of her life, she had a pure heart and her bodily actions followed. She never sinned. She was ever holy. So no wonder we just celebrated the Assumption on August 15th. She never split herself body from soul in, on earth. And so she's in heaven, body and soul, along with her son. Two persons right now, body and soul together in heaven. Next, the third thing, okay, remember we did language, body, spoken, and truth, and then holiness is body and soul together. The gift of self via the body is the meaning of life. That's the third concept I would give to young people. The gift of self through the body, which is the only way we can give the gift of self, is the meaning of life. So for little kids, what can we say? For even public school kids, what can we say? Look, when you are nice and you share your pencil, when you help each other, and you have to do that through the body, that is ultimately love. So the gift of self is a code word for love. But if we think about the word gift and our bodies, then that shows it's not just us giving something. It's giving ourselves. Later on in the theology of the body, this is probably too complicated for kids, but he'll say this. Jesus gives the gift to us in the Eucharist. And then the Holy Father adds this. He says, but it's not only this gift that he gives, it's his very self. And so what kids then learn is, it's not like some sort of external thing, this gift I give, but it's me together, body and soul, the language of my body, giving the gift of myself. And that's the meaning of life. Love is the meaning of life. So what I've tried to convey to you are these ideas of Body being very significant with regard to life. And I hardly mention, I didn't have to mention Jesus. I wanted you to for y'all. But this idea, sorry, y'all, I'm from Texas. Uh, the, the idea of the, this bodily gift, this body and holiness, this body with the language of the body is so significant. And have I mentioned once sexuality? No, why? Because I like to broaden it so that we can start instructing kids at a young age, not to mention ourselves living all this now. Um, Paula and Press and Media, they're going to publish my kids' book series uh, January in 2015. It's for one to four-year-olds and then five to eight-year-olds. Of course, none of that's going to mention sexuality. This is like really a time bomb, as George Weigel calls it, this theology of the body. But what happens when we don't get it, this idea of body being significant? Well, then the opposite is telling lies with the body. And so I put that kind of X through it. So how are some ways that kids and we ourselves might find this telling lies with the body? I'm into the idea of a smile. But think about laughter. What is laughter supposed to do? It's supposed to bond us together. And what do kids often do with laughter? Ha ah. ha. They tell lies, we might say, with the language of their body by using the gift of laughter, which is for bonding, to isolate and make fun of another. The body matters. And then we, we say this idea of um, 
the, the gift of self being, you know, the, the main part of um, the way we give ourselves with the body? Well, the language of the body of gift is truth, but when we hold something back, that's a lie. So it's also a violation of the body. So think about the kid who doesn't want to share his toys. I don't want to share. That's really going against the language of the body because how does the body, how is the body made? The body's made to be directed toward another. We are meant to give the gift of self to others. How do we know that? We have arms to hug each other, lips to kiss our loved ones. Eyes to look, we show we care. What does that tell us? It tells us that we're meant to be gifts to others. Living the truth of the language of the body is to be gift. Violating the language of the body is to hoard, to withhold the gift. It's the violation of the way God made the body. One little note here, um, obviously you wouldn't say this to kids, but I think this is what Pope John Paul did. He was pondering, okay, how can I help people to see the truth? The truth of what God wanted us to live, because after all, they won't listen to the church anymore. They won't listen to even any authority. What will they listen to? And I have a feeling he said, ah, they'll listen to their body. They'll find the truth in their body. In other words, the body speaks an objective language of truth if we know about it and realize it. Now, you should be thinking, oh, my gosh, you are really dangerous because a lot of teenagers are like, oh, yeah, I'm listening to the language of my body. And let me go and have this conquest and this, you know, whatever, right? So that's why I mentioned earlier about the inner movements of the heart. And the Holy Father says this. He says, we are not to live on the surface level of the body. He says, we are to get down to, he calls it the inner layers of the heart. So when we're teaching this, we have to make sure we don't make, you know, see, make it seem like it's a surface level listening to your body. But to make sure that they understand there's that ownership in the heart. And to figure out what the truth of the body is all about. I usually exercise um, three miles a day. And so that's my time of like thinking through new things. And so I'm like, okay, why in the world did God make me such that my eyesight is going, I'm 48 now. Why is my eyesight poor, less, right? What is the language of the body of a person who's getting older and I can't see close? It tells me to look far away. The person who's growing up should have a deeper vision in life, not just like this immediate stuff. So I'm sort of a fundamentalist of the body, you know, fundamentalist Bible dumping people. I'm sort of that way with, with the body, okay? So I know there's a caveat there, but I don't mind taking that extreme. That's what Aristotle says. When we go to one extreme, we should go to the other. And one more note on that. You might say, well, society nowadays, they glorify the body. They concentrate too much on the language of the body. And I would say, no, that is surface living. They're not getting to the depth of the person. And furthermore, they don't see the body as a sacrament. It goes back to that idea of avatar. So the opposite of living the language of the body, spoken in truth, is lying with the body. And then we could do the idea of Instead of having this pure heart with bodily actions following, what's the opposite? Splitting. And so that's what sin is. Sin is when I know in my pure heart, and by the way, I don't mean pure heart like in a sentimental way. I mean I know what's right and wrong. Well-formed conscience. And then I don't do it. The way the Holy Father puts it in the theology of the body is he says there should be no antithesis between that which is spiritual and that which is sensible. No antithesis, no antagonism between that which is spiritual, our inner self, who we are, and then that which is sensible, sensible of the body. So the more you and I grow in holiness, there's not going to be this rupture. But what does society tell us all the time? Basically, to either the pure heart, you know, do whatever you feel like, so then this doesn't even matter, or, you know, just do whatever, you know, you want to do, not thinking about the deeper aspects of the meaning of the body. So sin, you know, I've, I've thought about this. 
I'd love to talk with y'all um, with the question and answer part. Um, can we chase every sin to the split of body and soul? I dare you to try to come to me and say, no, 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 I've figured out one, Monica. Like, for instance, this little boy, um, I, was, I was teaching this concept. He was in, I think, seventh or eighth grade, Arlington, Texas. And I said, okay, this is your homework, and you're passing it up to your teacher. What is the language of the body saying? It says, teacher, I did this. But what if inside, in his heart, he knew that he cheated, but in his heart, he knew cheating was wrong? So in his heart, he knew cheating was wrong. Then he cheats, and then he tells a lie with the language of his body. So he's splitting body from soul. You know what he said to me? He raised his hand, interrupted my talk, and said, Miss, so are you saying I'm splitting myself all day long? And I said, I don't know. Are you sinning all day long? But do you see what it did for that young man's mind? Instead of saying, be holy, be holy, and what does that mean? It's be holy. Notice body and soul together. Now, we've got to make sure that people don't become scrupulous, right? Um, the proper balance. But really, the idea of the point of departure of the body is so significant. And then finally, remember the gift of self is the meaning of life? Well, y'all probably know this. The opposite of love is not use. I mean, is not hatred. The opposite of love is using others. Use. And so if you're in a public school, you don't have to say, oh, gosh, you know, when you're using others, that's violating God's law. Instead, you just say, look, remember the gift of self? You're supposed to share. You're supposed to give life to others. But when you use and when you take, that is the opposite of love. Or you might say it this way, you know, um, is the only time you talk to little Johnny when he could give something to you? Maybe he's smart at math or whatever. And then at, uh, otherwise you don't talk to Johnny? That's called using. And then if I were you, I would turn it on him and say, haven't you ever been used before? What happened? How did you feel? And then they'll start thinking, oh, okay, so if I do this, then it's the opposite of, the, you know, I don't want to feel that way. So the idea of the opposite of love is use. Oh, my gosh. When I found that out all these years ago, I changed my life. I'm like, holy mackerel, I only call my parents when I need something. And I was 30-something. So I would challenge you and me, like, are you using the, the shopping clerk? Are you using the other person on the road who's in your way, driving car? All these other ways that we could think about the opposite of love is use.